A building should be its purpose, design an ethic made aesthetic. Walking into a library today is like biting into an apple and finding sunflower seeds. <laughs> Were you hungry when you read this poem? I know it's not that it's not that funny, but it just makes me chuckle. I don't know why. It is kind of funny. I think it's because I was trying to, you know, when you try and you try and mimic someone else's style or the style of some some famous quote or poem. Mm -hmm. I was trying to mimic like those quote from like an old wise person mm. biting into an apple and finding sunflower seeds. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But today, we're designing the perfect apple. Or the perfect library. Yeah, just going with the metaphor. Mm -hmm. The solar scene library and also the solar scene classroom. Yeah, exciting. I'm really excited for this episode because I've brought no facts, no research, no statistics. This is like purest essence of solar scene for me, which I think sometimes we stray from in episodes. It's true. Because we mentioned last week, sometimes we get a little bit too critical of the present. Mm. Sometimes I think we get too bogged down in practicality or like trying to make concessions. Mm -hmm. There should be no concessions. There should be no compromise. Solar scene is uncompromising. It's the whole point. It's a utopia. We're designing the perfect future. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the, the poem, it was just like, we've talked about this, the, this thread of like disingenuous design I find in, in probably best encapsulated in modern libraries, where it's like, mm -hmm. it's called a library, but then you go in and you ask, where are the books? Yeah, it's just an empty room with like a computer in it. And it's like, well, you can look up the books. And we'll bring them to you or something weird like that. Or those magazines, mm. the video game section. Yes. I love video games, but it's not the place. This is what I'm saying. Like the apple has forgotten its seeds. Mm. I like that. Thank you. My library might have a lot of different types of seeds in it when we get into the design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But to each their own apple. Just also before we start the episode, we should introduce our special guest today. Oh, yes. If you're watching on YouTube, we have our characters who we created a long time ago for a non-existent stop motion film. So Aaron has Dozer, Dozer who is short, a red... Short for bulldozer. Yes. Right. Little red guy. And then I have Petal. Yeah. And she is a little green petal. And she was <laughs> going to be the environmentalist and he was going to be the <laughs> pragmatist. Well, I don't know. I just like the design of him. He mm -hmm. looks so angry. He does look very but this angry. Is, these are our avatars. This is what I'm... Like, I brought these out just before we recorded. And I said, let's have these guys on because it's like, <laughs> it fits the theme, which is today, the seeds. This is like my seed. This is like okay. your seed. This is the, it's the purest essence of Alicia and, and the Baron. I like that. And I also had this other quote, which I thought could be like the solar scene motto. I know this okay. is sounding really wild to start the episode, which is, we are who we pretend to be. I like that. Because the solar scene, I was thinking about it the other day, sitting in the park when everything was all lovely because it's springtime now. And mm -hmm. everyone was having so much fun and like playing. There's this really cartoon scene that I mentioned to you of a father playing or throwing a baseball back and forth to his son. Mm -hmm. There was just a group of exceptionally tiny dogs kind of squirming around in the mm -hmm. grass. And the other day, we also saw a rabbit. We did. And a harness and a leash, mm -hmm. which was just nuts. But it was just this idea that so was seen as a thought experiment is about designing this perfect place because mm -hmm. it's kind of nice to inhabit that for at least an hour a week is like in conversation, which is what we do. But it's also can be extended to construct ourselves as the ideal library goers or classroom mm -hmm. inhabitants. Because classrooms are at least partially, if not mostly, composed of all the people that are in it. Like that's m more important than the architectural design, really. And mm -hmm. So too our libraries, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's an interesting thought that I haven't had concerning spaces and the solar scene is like, yeah, we can design the infrastructure and the layout of the cities and the governments and everything, but we also need to talk about the solar site, solar person. Yeah. Solar me. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's not like judgment, like people should be like this. Mm -hmm. It's more like, I want to be like this. Yeah, I'm like in libraries. Yeah, and painting your, the picture of yourself that you want to be for yourself. I like that. So, starting with the library, which I also think, like, this is going to sound super anecdotal of an episode, but the other day when we were in a bookstore, it was a university bookstore close mm -hmm. to us. And I thought, bookstores are kind of like libraries, and universities are also kind of like libraries. True. And I found this quote online which says, a university is just a group of buildings gathered around a library. It's true. Which is by Shelby Foote, which I thought was really, really mm -hmm. hilarious. And again, on theme for the essence of the thing. Like the essence of a library is a book. And the essence of a university is... Books. Books, yeah. Yeah. I was really surprised when I was in university for the first time and realized we're just working through this textbook. Like the teacher obviously is bringing something, but without this textbook and this guide, what would we be doing? Like you could just read the textbook and almost 
learn everything you were learning in the classroom. And that was, for some reason, really mind-blowing to me because I thought it would be very different in university. It's true, but, I mean, we've talked about that at length in the education series, you yeah. know, the previous six episodes, but it's like, what it also does is, at first, it kind of devalues the classroom because, oh, I could teach myself this. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, I think, when you really think about it, it, it puts more value on the, I think so. the lecture experience or the classroom experience because mm -hmm. if it's not for the books and for the knowledge, you know, per se, what else is it for? Do you want to see my library mood board? Yeah, sure. So for those of you listening, I would describe my library as a mix between a classical library, a very Baroque, ornate, highly decorated space, and do you see that image on the bottom, the um, dark one? Yes, I see that. Do you know what that is? It looks vaguely like the Matrix. It's the Ministry of Magic. Okay, of course. Or Ministry of Mysteries. The room with all the little orbs. Yeah, the prophecies. Because the prophecies. Because I was thinking, I also have pictures of trees and a beehive. Yeah. And I'll explain it all. But basically, my library, I want it to be very classical. But I was looking at libraries all over the world. Because for some reason, when an architect has a project, like their, their piece de resistance or whatever, it always seems to be a library. Those are like really cool in every city. Mm. Even the city we used to live in had a really cool library. So I looked at a bunch of famous libraries and gathered the essence from all of them that I liked. And so it's going to be Baroque and stylish. So it's going to be frescoes. It's going to be partially underground, not like all super deep in the ground, but just like right below the ground. And then in the middle is going to be a fake or real, probably fake tree that's like huge, like no, one of the biggest trees in the world. It should be real. But just wait. But then it's going to go up way above ground, and it's going to be hollow. Mm. And you're going to be able to walk up the spiral staircase Whoa. and there'll be books on the inside of the tree. Dumbledore. Kind of, yeah. So like that. The, the tree will have books in it, and the underground part will have different sections, and it's all going to be color-coded, but not in a super like bright neon way, but in a, a simple. like Because we think of colorful, and you think of like primary colors, which is going to be a trend today for me, I think. But I mean, like, just pastels are like simple different shades of colors, still very earthy and natural, but everything will be color coded by type of book, by topic. Okay, so it's, it's organized, let me get this straight, it's organized like a regular library. Yes. But every edition that they have, mm -hmm. they have specifically chosen for its color so yes. that the shelves look like one constant gradient. Exactly. Very cool. Yeah, if possible, and I'm sure there'll be some... Some ways they might have to change it. Maybe it would be like the Penguin Library. No, if possible. Yes. So perhaps they need to print <laughs> their own. There's, they have their own publishing house and they yeah. publish their own version. Made of the tree. Made of the tree, perhaps. Also, the name of my library is going to be La Rouche, which means the beehive in French. Whoa, you named it. I did. Because I want the shelves to also slightly be beehive-ish. Hexagonal. Hexagonal. Nice. Because there's this... Library in China, and it's called, it's nicknamed, I suppose, The Eye, and it has thousands of shelves, but they're all slightly tapered, so you can walk along them, Whoa. and they go super high, it's like crazy looking, <laughs> if you are at home, you can look it up, but they're tapered, and so I just imagined, it looked like you're on the inside of like an anthill, so I wanted to be like you're on a beehive, and the part about the Ministry of mysteries or i can never remember what department of mysteries department of mysteries is that this is all very like earthy and historical and just kind of like a normal library but i always found it cool in that scene in harry potter where there's all the the orbs yes. it just like it's just some element of like light and like artificial light obviously perhaps in like some of the there's like a section and it's like all of the the dark books like the as it gets darker maybe in shades Ooh, can i like find an idea yeah <laughs> Mobile lights, little drones. I like that. The bees. <gasps> Perfect. The bees for the beehive. Perfect. Also, speaking Harry Potter, I didn't really choose this, but I was thinking for yours, the restricted section yeah. in Hogwarts, where they have to walk around with a little lantern. Lamp. Yeah. yeah. Like I was picturing just like there's some section that's actually just, like dark creepy. and dingy and creepy. creepy. Then obviously there's like the tree and it's and all The nice. bees in that section will sting you. Yeah, and they're one of real the books, bees. When you pull it off the shelf, it just screams. Yeah, so that's what I'm picturing. My library will also have different sections that aren't books. It'll have a tool library. It will have a hobby library, I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you say, I'm going to get into watercolors. 
and then you do two watercolor paintings and you don't like it. You could rent out some watercolors and same with different other hobbies, a camera, a pair of knitting needles, just a place to like explore different interests, mm -hmm. but not have to like buy the things and can like and have them forever. And then also an art studio and a tech library all within. That's why it's kind of the beehive all connected, I pictured. So oh, I see. that's La Rouge. I have a few questions for you. Yes. How much natural light? How much window light? It's going to... <laughs> my hope was for it to be pretty much all natural light, mm -hmm. beside obviously the dark part. Mm -hmm. I'm picturing the tree probably having just all little like portholes. Like, okay, yes. I want it to all be naturally lit because I don't like artificial light and I find it makes me feel slightly cramped but then there will be portions of like the underground parts as I was saying that have just like nice artificial light because I find sometimes when you're studying and you can just see so much going on outside it's like distracting so I feel like there's a reason that libraries don't have that many windows but I do want it to somehow be natural. My other question was how noisy is it? Very quiet. Okay my third question is how many new books? Because I know you've been on that kick recently. You've been wanting to read a very new book. That's mm -hmm. been your only requirement, that it be <laughs> true. new. Yes, decent amount of new books. I think we'll have a lot of international books and also historic, obviously. It's going to be huge. Like I picture it being like literally acres mm -hmm. of space. <laughs> so there's plenty of room for new books. And I think true. they should be slightly curated so you don't have like a romance section the size of a country because I feel like if you printed out all the romance books or whatever there'd be a lot but some new. La Rouge. La Rouge. Sounds very exciting to me. Thank you. That's a place I'd want to visit. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a name for my library or any images but I'll name. just describe it for you. Okay. So there's three layers mm -hmm. and also I feel like you mentioned it you said there was a really nice library and then the cities where we used to live. Mm -hmm. I was also wearing that inspiration on my sleeve assuming that we we're referring to the same one which is the library that was on our campus. No, I was talking about oh. the, the <laughs> Halifax, just like the regional library, which I don't love, but everyone like posits it as some kind of architectural, architectural feat. Yeah, because yeah. it looks like a stack of books. But it's awful. I don't like it. Well, there are nine books in it. There are about nine or ten. I yeah. really, I, uh, that was actually what I was referring to as the sunflower seeds. It's wild seeds. how few books there are. Sunflower seeds, man. Yeah. Sunflower seeds. <laughs> I don't mind public community spaces. In fact, mm -hmm. we've, we've advocated for them in the social scene many times. But don't call it a library because it's disingenuous. It's true. It's not a library. It's just a space. Yeah. And I was, um, yeah, with the university library I was referring to, it was kind of getting associated with that quote, a university is just a group of buildings gathered around a library mm -hmm. because our university campus had two libraries. Mm -hmm. And I think that they, they really well kind of summarize the good and the bad. Mm. One of them, the main one, was in this big brutalist building. I mean, the architecture was beside the point, but you walked in, and firstly, it sounded like there were 10,000 people inside, yeah. <laughs> roaring like a stadium. But you were also stadium. underwater at the same time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was an ugly distortion. And yeah. secondly, the all pervasive scent of Subway. Mm. Subway, eat fresh. Subway, eat fresh, um, where I spent many a, many a night. <laughs> <laughs> But again, that's beside the point. There was also a, a pretty loud coffee place, a smoothie place. Mm. The sound of blenders while you're just Fruit trying to cram. Fruit was being blended. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't that nice. It was a lot more of a community space. The books they had were, I mean, it was a research library. So, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't, it's not really fair to compare it. But the experience of being in there was not what I would call a nice library. No, you could literally get lost in the stacks. They were that... Yeah, chaotic. I mean, I don't mind the stacks, <laughs> but it's it's that it's that idea that what's this for? Is this for mm -hmm. learning? Then why why do we have a subway? Mm -hmm. It's that kind of thing. I don't mind having a subway on campus, but why is it in the library? Yeah. Enough about that. <laughs> the library that's serving as my main inspiration for for my solo scene yeah. was where I spent many a many a proud afternoon and morning, mm. I would say, which was I think just two levels, but it was full of books. It was so so classical, mm. so so classical. And I think we might have mentioned it on the podcast before, but it just had really nice busts, paintings, mm. art. There was, there was such a quiet and studious atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And our favorite part of it was when you went downstairs into the little basement floor, 
there were these desks ringing the perimeter of the room, still mm -hmm. big stacks of, of uh, bookshelves, but these desks ringing the room, which were little isolated pods, basically. You could mm -hmm. almost close yourself in and just shut out the world. There were no windows. Mm -hmm. And it was so, so focused. It was my, my favorite place I've ever found to do work, really, my favorite building. So yeah, reading there, writing there, doing work there, it was just, that was the best. But I also wanted to include some of the community elements. I feel like your beehive maybe yes. represents a little bit. So basically the bottom floor of my library is like that. It's underground. It's ab absolutely silent. It's all mm -hmm. for reading and writing. It's lit by lamps. I like that idea. There are no windows. Mm. I've never really been in a lamp lit like, room like that. I think it's interesting because you and I all like always talk about just more natural light the better. But it's true yes. when you're trying to study. You want lamp light, you want <laughs> candlelight, you want... It, it channels your energy in such yeah. a positive way. Well, I like being outside to read and write, but mm -hmm. what windows means is distractions because you yeah. can see movement. What exactly. I like about no windows is that there's pretty much no movement. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just books, books everywhere. So many books, mm. so many books. <laughs> I mean, my favorite, we, for some reason we had seats. I know it sounds really nerdy. It's like, oh, yeah. that's my place. You know mm -hmm. where to find me. I'll yeah. be there. I think one time you actually did find me there, I which did. is such a TV thing. It like is. I didn't tell you I was going to the library and you <laughs> thought I'd find you here. <laughs> and it just turned up. But it was because it was right in the back and there was like the philosophy section. And I'm mm -hmm. no philosophy student, but I know the names and just the names on the spines of the books is enough to inspire me. Mm -hmm. And my, it kind of goes up in terms of um, casualness, I guess. Mm -hmm. So the ground level floor of my library, the three floors, has some sounds. Mm -hmm. It has, instead of the individual desks on the ground floor, we have long tables. I like with that those idea. green lamps. Cool. Like in New York? Yeah, like in New York for yeah. doing detective work. Cool. I really like those green lamps. And there are some busts, some artwork, but it's again mostly books. There's a reception desk. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think is really important is that the books have the little renewal slip. Uh, I agree on, with that. Yeah. Inside the book, not digital. Mm -hmm. Not digital. And you might say this is kind of just an outdated, like, oh, well, that's just, you know, there's no point for that. But there is a purpose because. Mm -hmm. When it's not in the book, I don't know when to return the book. It's That's the so issue. True. I forget it. And I know you can go on the website, but sometimes I don't want to go on the website. I just want to go to a library and get a book. It's true. And what also, if you've watched Whisper of the Heart, you might have a meet cute with someone by finding all the, oh, I've been reading all the same books as this person. We're in love. It's and then you fall in love and you get married and make violins. It's true. Yeah. This, this, this middle floor is the most kind of typical library that I have. Mm -hmm. So there's also the really tall shelves with, with the sliding ladders. Ooh. Yeah. Good point. But, but I was thinking of ways to modernize it for the TikTok, or should I say book talk generation. Mm -hmm. And one thing I thought would be neat that I actually remember myself doing as a kid, but I think they could do an adult version of, is little reading lists and reading challenges. Because mm. people love today, I don't even know if most people would, um, would be able to get around without it, the fact that they have a music and a movie algorithm to show them they're mm -hmm. recommended or movies like this. But for books, it's a lot more difficult. It's you true. can go by author, you can go by genre, but that's still kind of shooting in the dark. So if you had a personalized, curated list made by humans, because presumably mm -hmm. the people who work at libraries love books, then I think that'd be really, really neat. I remember, I think I was seven, and f for the summer, my, my local library did a thing with all the kids, which was like a little map, a little paper map, and each book that you read kind of ticked off a place and you're That's working neat. your way across. Something like that, but for grown-ups. I know we don't need to be treated like children, but something to kind of track your progress or to just for the practicality of finding new books, I think would be really awesome. Yeah, to channel your energy, because sometimes you read a book and say it's in the dystopian genre. Yeah. But then you read that one and you're like, have I tasted this genre? Do I know about mm. this genre? Yeah. Odds are there's five books. If you read them, you have a good idea of that genre yeah. or of a topic. You read one book on running and you're like, oh, do I know everything about running? Should I read more? Yeah. And then these lists would kind of help you. Well, for fiction, you were just saying, I want a new book, but I don't want it, but I want it to be a good one, basically, mm -hmm. which is really hard to, to find. You're, you're kind of wandering your way around the dark mm -hmm. if you're trying to access a new genre or a new era in, a, in literature. Yeah. So yeah, I just think having that helping hand would be would be very good. I agree. You said that I'm trying to find a new book, and I did find one. Okay. And I'm going to use it to transition to our topic about the ideal classroom in a bit. 
which I'm excited to share because this book, I like stumbled across it because it went to a bookstore. And I was like, I want something new. And I thought this book was written in the 60s. I got home and was trying to figure out, I was like, this doesn't seem like it was written in the 60s. 2014. Hmm. So it scratches my edge. Nice. Okay, I'll just wrap up my wipe very quickly then. So the underground pool that I mentioned is kind of like the essence of effort, academic effort. Yes. Pure isolation. The middle floor is just pure library. Mm -hmm. So that's like the library in Beauty and the Beast. Yes. They have really tall shelves, yeah. right? The top floor is more, more of the community space. It smells like coffee. Ooh. Yeah, I realize I actually, I actually like the smell of coffee. I find it comfortable. I, I don't drink coffee and I never have. Mm. But the other day I was wandering around a university, as I do, as one does, um, <laughs> and going through like the, it was, a, it was a hallway where you could tell there were no lecture halls, no classrooms. It was just teachers' offices. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it was the English section. Mm -hmm. And it just smelled so much like coffee and old books. And I was like, this is so cozy. Mm -hmm. And I know this is, this is the appearance of autumn, Aaron, mm -hmm. even though it's springtime, but it yeah. happens sometimes. So this one is more inspired by like the Gryffindor common room. Yes. And SpongeBob's library mm -hmm. with an armchair. Love that room. And the other place was one that I knew of many years ago, but had forgotten about until I was preparing for this episode, which is the Diogenes Club from Sherlock Holmes. True. Which is like yeah. this, it used to be, I think they used to be called gentlemen's clubs, mm -hmm. which is where obviously now everyone could go there. But it was just <laughs> like you, um, it's just a place. And I had this quote describing it. Um, I think it, this is Sherlock speaking. He says, there are many men in London, you know, who some from shyness, some from misanthropy, have no wish for the company of their fellows. Yet they are not averse to comfortable chairs and the latest periodicals. Hmm. It is for the convenience of these that the Diogenes Club was started. And now it contains the most unsociable and unclubbable men in town. No member is permitted to take the least notice of any other one. Save in the stranger's room, no talking is, under any circumstances, allowed. It's funny. So it wouldn't be so drastic as that. Like, there would be talking allowed, but it would be a, just be quiet atmosphere. There'd probably be a fire. Hmm. There'd be some chess boards. There'd yeah. be armchairs. There'd still be books. There'd yeah. still be a lot of people reading. There'd be coffee. It would just be like a little, a little place for that, which I, I don't think there is any. Yeah, a place to people watch, perhaps, and say, yeah. hey, this person's here all the time, and they're reading this type of book, which I'm interested in. Exactly. Maybe they'll ask their opinion on our way yeah. out. But also to talk. To like, talk. This is not going to be like Sherlock's, where it's completely to silent. To converse. Like, yeah, there is some conversation club. That's what I call conversation it. Conversation pit. Ooh. Yes, except it's not a pit because it's on the top floor. It's true. Yeah. Conversation crow's nest, maybe. Yeah. Do you picture this library being suitable for children? No. No, this is an adults only library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that sounds kind of mean, but no, I do think libraries are really important for kids. I just, mm -hmm. It's just not what I designed. That's fine. It's fine. Yeah. I'm not mad about it. <laughs> I sense you are a little bit better with your beehive. You can imagine the kids swatting all the little bee drones at the air. The bee drones. I think that's a, a weirdly <laughs> funny idea because I was thinking of having something mechanical that was very like very unrealistic it yeah, was of course. floating bookshelves yeah that like rotated because mm. you were saying the ladders to reach up high yeah. but there's this this library in mexico where they do rotate like that and it always feels like in movies when they're like searching for evidence or something like oh, yes. you said for some reason pull one book out yeah then they rotate yeah. so something like that there's something weirdly mechanical but the in the Vintage vibes. The, yeah, like a steampunk bee. You yeah. like charge it up and then it goes. Yeah. <laughs> the bees could also be leaving behind sometimes little fluorescent uh, dots of light, which is like their honey. Nice. But really, it's kind of dangerous because they're just spilling oil all over the <laughs> library. <laughs> yeah. Probably not so bad as mine, which is full of dust and lamps. The book I'm reading right now is called The Emissary. And it is a dystopian novel novella Aaron thinks it is but it's in a really positive tone and it's short and it's it's really cool anyway I'm going to read this little quote to transition us it says electrical appliances had met with disapproval ever since electric current was discovered to cause nervous disorders numbness in the extremities and insomnia a condition generally known as bits bits syndrome Newspapers carried reports of chronic insomniacs who slept soundly at camping grounds in the mountains where there was no electricity. A popular writer published an essay 
on how the sound of a vacuum cleaner drove all thoughts of the novel he was writing out of his mind. Though this essay probably wasn't the only cause, around the time it was published, resentment against vacuum cleaners began to spread throughout society. To Yoshiro, who had always thought of the vacuum cleaner's metallic groan, must come through a tunnel from the depths of hell, this was a welcome trend, and so on and so on. But this book is, it's post-apocalyptic kind of, but it's just, there's always these funny little things about, oh, we don't use technology now, or oh, we realize that something we used to just always do is bad for us. And a lot of them are kind of silly, like, like electricity causing insomnia, but I also just feel like maybe it's not that silly. No, in a roundabout way, it's, it's, all, it's all there, isn't it? Yeah. So my classroom is probably going to have very limited technology okay. and electronics. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Let me just ask you first, what age group were you imagining in this classroom? Mm, I was imagining... Just like seven and eight-year-olds, grades like two, Yeah, I would two say three. For, for young kids, it's probably a good thing. Yeah. So I'll start, I suppose, with the role of technology in my classrooms, which will be there will be technology, but it will be used for a purpose. It's like you're not going to teach someone how to tie their shoes on an iPad. But sometimes in classrooms, I find these days they would just for the sake of it. Hmm. But you're also not going to teach someone how to code using paper and pencils. It's true. Like, if you're going to teach someone to code, you need computers. You're going to teach someone how to edit a video, take pictures. You need those tools. You're not going to teach someone to cook on a computer. Teach them to cook in the classroom. And that's really my thinking behind it. Because I do think kids and people, like you need to be equipped for real life. And using the Montessori and the Waldorf method, which I was highly inspired from for my classroom, they're all about we want them to be equipped for the real world but like actually equipped, not just theoretically equipped. Do you want to see my mood board? Yeah, of course. So this is my ideal classroom mood board. It doesn't have a name. It's just the classroom. So in Waldorf theory, it's something I found that was so cool and it like blew my mind and you're going to like it, is that they color code the classrooms based on the age of the kids and their development. Okay. So when the kids start school, it's a really soft, mellow yellow then it slowly warms up into oranges and reds. And then as they get older, it develops into cooler tones of more serious blues and Ooh. greens and a bit less, a bit colder. And so <laughs> it, that just cracked me up. And they also said they don't just like paint the walls yellow. They use this technique, which makes it kind of look like watercolor. And that's just the standard across Waldorf classrooms. It reminds me mildly of, um, this sounds kind of morbid, but a, a children's hospital. Um, that I have been to a while where they kind of um, they color code each department, each section mm -hmm. with, and it's like um, in Wizards of Oz where you have to follow the mm -hmm. follow the lines. It's kind of like that, right? It's also vaguely Hogwartsy, except instead of by personality, it's by age, which mm -hmm. makes a little bit more sense. A little bit more sense, but I am going to stick with that trend of color coding the classrooms based on age. The classrooms are going to be rather colorless, with the exception of the walls, because there was research done on kids development and their focus and if the classroom is really busy they're looking around think about how many times you're in a classroom and you memorized every poster in the room it's very true instead of listening to the teacher we're all guilty you, of you it you miss 100 percent of the shots you know you don't take yeah surround yourself with those who sharpen you and then it's the, the, all the pencils and the really <laughs> yeah. short pencils. although i do love that quote it's true but like the simple vibes of the classroom is really important to kids because you think, well, they need simulation and like they need to be, their minds need to be engaged, but it's like they should be engaged with what you're engaging them with, not with what's on the walls. And apparently a lot of it also comes from marketing of the people, of the scholastics and the... I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine <laughs> the market it. for um, posters that go on the back of the classroom door is absolutely lucrative. It is. Yeah. yeah. So my classroom is going to be very simple, colorless, but not uninteresting. I think my classrooms are going to be super textured, is how I described it. Because I always remembered in elementary school classrooms, they would have a rug where you'd go to read. Did you have those? Um, kind of. My, my elementary school was very crazy. Each room was like, was like its own thing. Like there mm. was the rug room. There was, okay. there was one room that had a bunk bed style structure, jungle gym-esque actually. Mm -hmm. This big wooden thing that you could kind of just 
crawl in, get lost in. It was, it was weird, but it's just like cool. a grade five classroom. So it wasn't for babies. No, I think that's interesting though. Yeah, I do think so too. And so it's going to be very textured. My classrooms will have stages, which the kids can do performances on or presentations. Because there's always something fun when you're a kid about standing on a stage, even if it's just five centimeters higher than the main floor. There's something like really empowering and exciting about it, I find. You like okay. own it. Yeah. Because I've I had a Sunday school classroom that had a stage. And I remember like when you'd get to go up there, it was it was really nerve wracking, but also a fun opportunity to in a tiny way overcome that stage fright, which we all kind of have innately. I noticed a lot of clay on your mood board. And let me mm -hmm. ask does this have a reason or is it just an extension of your recent infatuation <laughs> with cups, which seems to be dominating your entire personality lately? It has a reason. Right. It was to show several things. You're going to be the teacher and the students are all going to make you cups. Yeah, I thought <laughs> I was going to have a wall of cups. I do like cups. I don't know what it is about them lately, but I've been really liking them. Just the perfect cylindrical shape. Yeah, we're drinking. That's all you can do with them, but yeah. No, the texture of clay, I think, is really interesting, and kids just love it. They love mud. But also, I want my classroom to be very hands-on. So I have a picture. It's hard to tell what's on the shelf, but it has a bunch of knitting needles, yarn, fabric. So people, like, there'll be a lot of making and freedom to, oh, on your lunch break, you don't want to go outside today, you want to play with these craft supplies, go for it. And obviously, they'll be well-stocked. I also want my classrooms to have a mini library, so I have a picture of a nice little Victorian library here. Okay. Which I think would be fun to have a portion of the classroom which is like that. So it's a bit of everything. A little it's bit a, of everything. It's a library, you've got the clay, you've got the mm -hmm. needles, maybe a tiny kitchen. A tiny it's, kitchen. It's everything, right? It's like a mini school and it's for grade two, grade, grade three kids. Yeah. One important part is that it has two or three grades in it. Yes, okay. Which I didn't mention, I suppose, but it... it has several grades and there's dividers that can go up and different things. So that's important. And it will have, yeah, very minimal posters, but some botanical drawings or something like that. Is there a class pet? Yes, I have a chicken as my class pet. I don't know if that's practical. Maybe you could have a chicken coop that like it has a little cat door. Maybe at the end of the year they could eat it. Or they could just harvest the eggs. Yeah, I guess. And pet it. Right, that might be mildly traumatic for the kids, but it yeah. might also might be a good life lesson. Maybe. Depends <laughs> on the teacher you get. Yeah, I had two more things I want to mention. Three. One, I have a picture of a uh, fort. So I think building forts outside and then a space for building forts inside. I think that's fine because kids, they just like building forts. Build your fort, read in it. Build mm -hmm. your fort, explain it or yep, whatever. Sure. Building forts. Um, kitchen, as I said, but like I want them to be able to prepare some of their own meals or some of their own snacks. For you. For me. Feed me. <laughs> And then one picture is just of a bunch of fabric, like, hanging on the wall. And I think it'd be cool to let the kids make their own costumes for plays or use this fabric for the forts or whatever. I really like that idea of having just, like, a ton of fabric. Kids just love it. No, that sounds nice. So it's yeah. very tactile. They can touch. This is for kids yes. exploring. They can touch the mud. They can touch the fabric. They can mm -hmm. touch the food. They can touch a chicken. Yes. The sounds, their sights. But it's not this. It's all neutral. It's, it's not just flat posters mm -hmm. you know giving the illusion of yes. busyness really it just it is busy and mm -hmm. what i'm getting from this is kind of where the weasleys live the burrow yes the burrow there's, there's always something going on mm. no i like that i think that would that would be yeah. very nice my kind of barometer for how i'm how i'm grading these libraries and classrooms is would that be a place i would like to go to as a student mm -hmm. and that would have definitely been a place i would like to Thank go to you. as a grade two or th grade three kid and I also don't think, at the start, I was thinking, oh, we have very different visions. But I actually think it's, it, um, it doesn't contradict mine. Do you want to see my mood board? Yeah. It's very small, so I'm not going to show the camera. I'll just have you describe it. <laughs> okay. Try not, to, um, try not to read the words. Okay. So it's a, a dome or a semicircle. So we have the big... It's a top-down view. Yeah. Top-down. So you have the students in a semicircle around the teacher, who I'm assuming is standing along the flat wall. And then it's all windows. I forgot to mention all my windows around the outside, too. Okay, you just copied mine. Do you want to read my notes? All windows in his dome room. It looks like there's a, a ukulele on the teacher's desk. Don't read it. I don't it. know what that is. Don't I'm read it. To not read it. <laughs> desks, and there's lines coming from the desks. I don't know what those give me mean. Give me that, give me that, give me that, give me that. 
but you can maybe explain it better than I can. Okay, so I'll start off by reading my inspirations for this classroom. Okay. I had the choir room in Gui. Ah. What I like from that is the feeling of absolute freedom that the kids have when they went in there. If anyone's seen Gui, mm -hmm. the kids are all basically persecuted. The main character kids are all basically persecuted by their peers. Mm -hmm. So they go into this one room and for their years in high school, this is where they can just sing their hearts out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So that's what my classroom is. It's a safe space, as they say. Mm -hmm. Another inspiration was the dance studio in which I took my first year acting class in university, mm. which was wildly uncharacteristic of me. <laughs> and even today, I kind of chuckle back, uh, chuckle looking back on it. But I'd also had literally never been in a dance studio before that. I know you mm -hmm. have. But those are, those are really, really cool, tranquil, but also, mm. but also energetic spaces. Mm -hmm. You have the mirrors, so I kind of have the windows here, kind of like mm -hmm. that. You have the wood. You can walk mm -hmm. around barefoot, which I think is really cool. And mm -hmm. we did. We did a university course barefoot. I can't <laughs> um, say that every day. Just, just truly inspiring spaces for me. And another inspiration, almost like looking at it the other way around, is a regular, kind of regular classroom that I had in university with desks, a smart board at the front, chairs, the teacher with his desk. It was a very, very simple square mm -hmm. classroom in university in which I took a course called Ancient and Medieval Theatre, which I loved. And the teacher was frequently getting students in, because it was full of theatre kids, mm -hmm. getting students in to do demonstrations, enact this. It's very fun. It was very um, immersive and very interactive. But it was mildly restricted by the room. So I was looking mm -hmm. at that and thinking, what are all the things that got in the way? So looking at regular classrooms, basically, and asking what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And another inspiration, the final one, is what we just affectionately termed from our university, the nice room. Nice room. Which was a lecture hall, which was just bright. It was. It was, it was steep. You're looking down at the professor at the bottom, a very typical shape, except it was curved almost, mm. which was nice. Had really, really big desks. Yeah, very big desks, very deep. So you, mm -hmm. were never, you never struggled for space. Mm -hmm. And something that I took from that for my desks, which are kind of clumped around the semicircle uh, mm -hmm. windows as you mentioned the flat wall is for teaching that's where the door is that's where the big uh, screen and chalkboard is and that's where the bookshelf is but the desks are all facing that mm -hmm. and they each have little electrical outlets on which cool. sounds mildly on solar scene a little bit but that is the presence of technology in this classroom mm -hmm. mine is mildly different from alicia's because i was imagining more 14 15 year old kids yeah which goes in with the question that we're doing after this, which is to explain how the sewing course will be taught. Mm -hmm. But just to continue with the classroom, so we have the windows, and the reason I did that is because, so the kids' chairs on the desk are actually facing out, mm -hmm. so they have their back to the room. Oh, yeah, that's they're, they're fine. facing the windows. Yeah. And one of the reasons I did that is so that if they have their laptop, the professor can always see what's on the screen. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And also so that they're just. There's just interesting stuff outside. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it will probably be on the second floor, so they're not going to be distracted mm -hmm. by like kids knocking on the window or whatever. Mm -hmm. and so there's just there's just movement, and it just kind of it gives us like a spaceship feel. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested by those restaurants, which would be like on the top of like a tower, mm -hmm. and they have the window looking out over the city. It's kind of like that. Cool. That's what I'm going for. And the reason the chairs are facing that way is so that when the students are actually listening and watching the, the professor or a presentation or a movie on the front screen, they have to turn their chairs away from the desks. Mm -hmm. So they're just sitting with no desk in front of them. Cool. So they're not taking notes. Mm. Because something I thought with technology as it is today, with online learning and how comfortable kids are now with reading PowerPoints or notes online and taking notes themselves, is that you actually don't really have much of an occasion you should ever be watching a professor mm. and half your attention going to writing what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Maybe all classes are recorded and they're sent to them and then they can take notes or whatever. But for the most part, I think you should be immersed watching the professor actually engaged in some mm -hmm. kind of exchange of ideas, even if you're silent. I um, like that dynamic nature of the turning the desks because it's almost like there's two classrooms in one. There's like your yes, personal classroom and exactly. then there's the, the communal one. Exactly. Yeah, that's for, for that age group, I think that's really important that distinction and the ability to just like by moving your chair you can make that choice that's all it is in your real life you can say i'm gonna make the choice to zone in here or do exactly do this. i'm either yeah. working by myself or i'm partaking in this mm -hmm. and did you like sitting at desks with other people yeah why i don't know i, I really don't i liked it too yeah 
I think part of it was that even if you didn't know the person or didn't like them, mm. you kind of you were kind of a mini team. I know. And then, oh, do you have an eraser? Exactly. Here's an eraser. Exactly. Oh, can I see your test answers? Sure, we'll, you can we'll see peek my over. test answers. No, but for, for cheating, though, really, professors, I think this is just the best way because the kids turn, they're facing the window, so it's not like they're in a prison. Mm-hmm. They're kind of in a, a little isolated cell. Mm, little cell. Um, <laughs> with regards to phones, mm. no phones allowed in the classroom. I think that's On a good idea. On the teacher's desk, I have a little square. Yes. It's a little box that all the phones get collected in. Phone bucket. Yeah. I know people would think that sounds mildly, like, tyrannical, but... Mm-hmm. I just think that they're, they're not helpful. Also on the teacher's desk, as you noted, was the instrument. I said guitar. Okay. This is what the teacher plays either for musical lessons or to accompany student performances, mm-hmm. as well as obviously all the papers and what's it called, stationery. That's also on the desk. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking mildly school of rock. Cool. Mine has a very musical artsy theme. That's why I said the dance studio. Yeah. The lines coming out of the desk that you mentioned, that's just all hardwood. Mm. And the stage... I'm calling it the stage. Yeah. The area where they can all stand is actually, instead of elevated, it's a little bit sunken. Because mm-hmm. I really like sunken living rooms. I yeah. think those are cool. But they're usually weirdly carpeted. Mm-hmm. This one is just cold stone, just cool. gray stone. And so too is the flat wall. Mm. Do you have any other questions? What types of subjects do you see being taught in this classroom? Just everything? Such a good lead-in. But yeah, mostly, mostly arts classes. Cool. course that I was designing my curriculum around Mm-hmm. We each took a course from the education zine. Mm-hmm. But first, maybe you want to describe something else. The organism of the week is the humble tulip. Do you like my tulip that I drew? Yeah, it does, I wouldn't say it looks humble. I would say it looks quite ostentatious. But, but that's the thing with tulips. Mm. They come in every single color. Really? Every single color. They, don't, they haven't really nailed down black yet. But they can get really, really, really dark purple. Yeah. And they're called black tulips. So I I count it as every single color. Black might be a shade, but tulips are so wonderful. They grow, like, so early in the spring. They're perennials, so they always just, like, pop up, and you're like, I forgot I had tulips there. Mm. These little green buds, and they're like, hey, guys, we're here. Do you always say that? I forgot I had tulips there. Yeah. Make you sound like you're 50. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no but at my house i used to be like i never planted tulips there and i'd be the only one who would really plant flowers and i'm like oh planted them forever ago and all around town lately there's these front yards of these tiny apartments like these tiny front yards they're just covered in tulips it's wild and i think tulips are wonderful and springy i was blown away to find that they came in every color Did you know that there was a tulip mania in the 17th century? No, I didn't. Me neither. But in the 17th century, there was a tulip mania, and it culminated, and there was this one variety of tulip which had a disease, which made them super not resistant to life. So they rarely (laughs) passed on their genes, and then the species would just die out, and it's super contagious. But then once you catch it, the flower basically dies in like a generation or two. So they're currently banned in the Netherlands. You cannot have this type of tulip. And they're called broken tulips. But they used to be so expensive during this tulip mania that if for one bulb, it'd be the same price as buying a ship. What? For one bulb of these broken tulips. Why is so, that? So because they were rare and people, there's like monopoly on them or something weird. <laughs> but they were, <laughs> there was a mania. And so tulips now, they're grown of everywhere they began in central asia and then they moved they were obviously brought all over and they can grow up to 70 centimeters tall cool and they're a genius genus of the lily family which i also didn't know i did you did yeah mr mr botany yes <laughs> i do like tulips they're kind of the, the harbingers of good weather and therefore good moods yeah they're like the symbol that says oh i can smile again thank you Thank you, tulips. <laughs> and they grow, yeah, they grow like throughout the summer. They start so early, but then they keep going. And they're just so beautiful. And I love when they're those mixed colors, but also when they're just so simple. They look like little Easter eggs on top of the stems. Tulips are lovely and just so, so cool. That was all. Thank you, tulips, for sponsoring this week's episode. Very nice. Did you want to do your course now or should I do mine? You do yours. Okay. 
So the course that I chose, as I said, we each chose one from the curriculum that we designed for the education zine mm -hmm. for kids who I think we suggested were age 14. Mm -hmm. We did five core classes and five electives. Mm -hmm. I chose an elective, which is called Language in Plays. Mm -hmm. And in the zine, we wrote down the learning objective for the course and also what the final assessment would be. So the learning objective for this course was to improve confidence and articulation through performance, memorization, debate, and analysis of famous plays and films. Developing media literacy and rhetorical skills are further goals. And the final assessment just said performance, but I'm mm -hmm. going to expand on that a little bit. But the reason I chose this course is because this is the one that I most would have loved to have taken in mm -hmm. middle school. Nothing like it was offered, but I think that would have really, really... Shaped you as a human? Yeah, for sure. Because when I mentioned that, that acting class I took in university, it was really, really enjoyable. But one thing that I, I can't help but think looking back on it is that it would have been even more effective if it had been just like five years earlier. Hmm. You know, it's kind of the later you leave that kind of thing in life, the less you are likely to pursue it, to enjoy it, for, mm -hmm. to, um, to excel at it for one thing. Yeah. Like that course was full of real, real theater kids who mm -hmm. wanted to act and were regularly acting. And I, I stood out because I have, what would you say, to be charitable, three expressions? You have happy, hungry, hungry, and really happy. Yeah, sure. yeah, those are your moods. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, also, something I forgot to mention about the classroom was that this is just an idea I had. I wasn't sure about the the, um, the practicality or indeed the legality of it. Mm -hmm. But the students could be in charge of the cleaning, or That's at least at least to, to a reasonable degree that they're not leaving it trashed every day. Yeah, I think it would really leave it in going by that glee example. Make it feel like their space. Yeah. I mean, from up on Poppy Hill, the movie, they had to clean the classrooms at the end of the day. It's true. They probably, there's places in the world that they do that. Yeah. I mean, it's always, it's always mentioned in like old American high school TV shows, mm -hmm. Punishment, they have to bang out the... The blackboard erasers. The blackboard erasers, yeah. Yeah. But I, I never see any of them sweeping. Mm. And I thought maybe with all the windows, it might be a little bit harsh if you just looked into the classroom and just saw a bunch of kids <laughs> sadly wiping the glass. But I don't mean, okay, maybe there could be some professional cleaning, but mm -hmm. for the most part, pick up after yourself should be an ethic that's instilled Yeah, wipe kids. down your desk if you spill your juice box. Exactly. I'm not going to do it for you, you lazy so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> this classroom I basically designed for this course. So that's why there's the stage. That's mm -hmm. why there's the dance studio vibe. You also have sneaky as an expression. I just remembered that. Sneaky? Anyway, sneaky, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, I started designing this course, which I'd never done before, and it was a really fun exercise, mm -hmm. because I think so often as students, we have all these ideas about why could teachers better. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, try and design a curriculum just yeah. for fun. Try and do it, because it's not actually that easy. No. And even in this um, no concessions, absolutely do what I want utopian thought mm -hmm. exercise, it's not that easy. It's true. Because you still have to try and cover things. You can't just do... You have to be practical. You can't yeah. just be like, okay, write an essay about... 18th century Rome. It's true. You have to teach it first, unfortunately. Yeah. But I started out by looking at what most syllabuses start out with, which is how your grade is broken down. Mm. Because that was something that I was always weirdly excited about the start of semesters in university. It was like, oh, let me see this course. Like, how many grades do I need? And then I kind of map it out mm. um, towards the end of my degrees because I was rather cynical about gaming the system to, to get a pass. But yeah. at the start, it was because I really wanted to do as well as I could. So I was looking mm. at all the grades. I actually really wanted to get good grades at the start. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. But on that note. That was just you. In my, um, in my acting class, one thing that I was always mildly disappointed about was that my grades were, were they weren't bad. But I knew, I knew for a fact that everyone else in the class was getting a lot better grade mm -hmm. than me. And it was lower than my usual grades. And this isn't me being like, oh, I deserve to get more because I didn't. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking for this for this um, class, them being grade eight students, and mm -hmm. probably even in the solo scene, somewhat reluctant, shy, hesitant to mm -hmm. really, you know, give some Daniel Day-Lewis performance in front of everybody else, I'm going to give the grade almost 100% just based on effort. Because mm -hmm. there's going to be some kids who are more naturally gregarious mm -hmm. or well-read. Mm -hmm. But if everyone's trying, that's, that's really the main thing, I think, for, for eighth grade acting class mm -hmm. or To enforce class. stuff like trying is cool. Trying is cool, yeah. yeah. That's what we're trying to show in here. Like in the Glee Club, everyone who auditioned got into the club. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Or to bring another movie into it, to relate it to my experience, 
picturing me in my theater class is kind of like that one quiet kid who was in Dead Poets Society. Mm -hmm. He wasn't quite with the rest of them. Yeah. Except at the end, he was the only one who jumped on his desk and said, oh, captain, my captain. Yes. So that's kind of what I was like. <laughs> Not really, but... So I split the curriculum into five little sections or units. And the first one is called, Why Do We Perform? Mm. And this one is really starting at the beginning, again, taking inspiration from an ancient and medieval theater course. And it's about the roots of performance as an artistic outlet, as well as what seems to me to be a cultural necessity. So yeah. this is all about the ancient, ancient histories of shamanism, performance, all in different cultures, and how pretty much every group of humans has done this weird, mm. kind of weird thing, which yeah. is put on masks and pretend to be something else, either to make other people laugh, to make other people cry, to make other people scared, or for religion or whatever it may be. Yeah. So that's kind of like to immediately answer the question that I think a lot of kids might have, which is, why am I doing this? Mm. It's like, well, this is why. This is why we do this. Yeah, it's an important and very useful foundation to lay. Yeah, and I think it's also about kind of um, connecting the dots mm -hmm. between animated movies or Shakespeare or even just the roles that we play in our everyday life, mm -hmm. Halloween, things like, things like that. I think, kids, I think that's a good jumping off point. And I didn't have like a, a key test or assignment for every unit, but one exercise I thought we could do for this was to dress up as animals. Fun. For some for some reason, I thought dressing up as animals would would do this. I think I remember doing something like that in my acting class, which was just act like an animal. Yeah. And the room probably looked like an asylum for people, anyone walking past. Yeah. But I remember I do remember something. I was like, act like a shape, move mm -hmm. like a shape. I, I think it was move like a shape. Fun. So it's like, well, how would a triangle move? Yeah. It's also like we teach kids animal noises. Why do we do that? Yeah, of course. It's, it's a cultural thing. It's, of course, because, yeah, babies know pig, cow. Yeah, before that's not, they know a lot of words. That's not key. No. From, for what they traverse. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just a, a holdover from when we actually did know Maybe. pigs and cows every day. But, yeah, that is interesting. The next kind of topic in the class is how to be an audience. Mm. So this is analyzing the effect of narrative on audience and also the blurring of narrative and news today. So this one is kind of, um, I imagine we'll be watching a lot of kind of biased news. This is like the media literacy portion, maybe staging a debate. I was thinking looking at political speeches and just how rhetoric affects people oh. and also how we can be critical readers, not just of fiction, but also events. Yeah. That's kind of important. Oh, something else I wanted to mention is just that the syllabus will be made available to kids at the start of the year. Yeah. I don't know why classes don't do that before university, but it gives it this nice, when they, not just the, the grade breakdown, but the mm -hmm. schedule of, of classes for the whole term. Because in university, that was always this, this great, very, very strong kind of bittersweet feeling I had in, in my courses, even the ones I really didn't like. When I, saw me getting, when I saw us getting down to the end of the schedule, I was like, we really don't get a lot of time here. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it gives kids the, the sense of time isn't infinite. Mm -hmm. You know, like this is precious. These are precious minutes and hours that we're, we're spending here. Yeah. I think for eighth grade kids, they're, they're old enough to look at that and kind of think about it. I agree. I remember there were a couple high school courses where we had the breakdown like that. And sometimes we're like, we're getting behind. We need to like work harder. Or, oh, we're ahead of schedule. And it was motivating in both ways. Yeah, motivating. That's the word for it. Yeah. The third section, of course, is just called Shakespeare. Of course. Because eighth grade, you've got to, you've got to read some of the Bard. Yeah. But one thing I think to make this a little bit more collaborative is that the students will vote on a play. That's a fun So maybe you, give them, maybe you give them some options, or maybe you don't even. But the students mm -hmm. get, will vote on a play so that they don't feel like it's being imposed on them. Mm -hmm. What do you think they would choose? Solacene Kids. Yeah, Solacene Kids. I feel like either Midsummer Night's Dream or Macbeth because they have so Ooh, many yeah. fun, dramatic characters. I feel like they would, yeah. Yeah. Maybe The Tempest. The Tempest, yeah. I could see it. Yeah, we did Macbeth in grade 8, and I remember being like, what? Because that was the first Shakespeare I'd ever read. I was like, witches? <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny and so cool. And yeah, we acted it out. So I feel like that's my 
my bias of like a first Macbeth to read or a first Shakespeare to read. Then. This class or this uh, unit is all about studying words, mm. how they can tell a story basically. Mm-hmm. And also obviously the meaning of the plays. So it's, you know, there's some thematic life lessons and yeah. things like that. But mainly the reason I chose Shakespeare is because I love him. I think he's the best English writer of all time. But also his stories have been so um, echoed and mimicked and reused all mm you know, even to movies up to today. Yeah. And also most of his stories, he themselves were echoes and reused of old mythology or stories that came before him. So it kind of contextualizes, you know, narrative through history mm-hmm. and say, oh, we're actually always telling the same stories, which is, which is really cool. Yeah. I think students would, would enjoy that. Yeah, they would appreciate it. I heard a quote for the first time a couple of days ago, and it was that, it was, I can't remember how it goes, you might know it, but it was like, did myth really happen? No. But it's always happening. And that's like, I really liked that. I wish I could find the exact wording. But I was like, that's so true. It's like, did, was there literally an apple in the Garden of Eden? But it's like, it happens every day. Like, does, like hmm. did it literally happen? Or is it just like always happening? That's, I feel like the Shakespeare would be a good point along the way to show people that. Yeah. yeah. In addition to all these units, I had the point that the students would always be reading by themselves. I actually mm. kind of cherished those 10 minutes in class in grade eight English when we used to read at the mm-hmm. start of class. So something like that, but mainly for, it's for reading outside of class. And there would be regular book reports, just mm-hmm. typical. I enjoyed doing those. I think they were meaningful. I think they teach you how to read quite well. And those could just be kind of traditional essays written and given to the teacher. Yeah. And in addition to that, there'd be these ongoing um, group assignments, which are students in groups, maybe they choose them themselves, maybe the, the professor assigns them, mm-hmm. reenacting film scenes Fun. on the little stage. Yeah. Just, oh, before class, we have these guys are going to give us something from The Lion King. And <laughs> I think that, I just think that would be fun. I don't know. And That's it, another maybe, Glee kind of reference. It, it definitely is. Yeah. And maybe the, um, <laughs> maybe the class could be asking them questions afterwards. Mm-hmm. Oh, why did you make, why did you do this? Why did you like this scene? What do you think? Well, serious questions though. Yeah. I think part of the problem with middle school is that kids becoming alienated with their work. Mm-hmm. So they don't care about their work because they have no, no, it was a sign for them that, mm. you know, they had no choice in it and it's not something that they enjoy doing mm-hmm. and they, it's not something they're proud of. Yeah. So I really think like, it sounds funny. They're doing a scene from the Lion King and I'm sure there would be some kids who are just making fun of it. Mm-hmm. But I really think over time they would start to take it seriously and yeah. start to take some pride in it. At least that's the that's mm-hmm. the hope. Yeah, I would encourage them to watch some films. I have no inspiration. I'm going to go watch this film. Yeah, or and as a group film. as well. Yeah. Oh, and the big screen at the start of the at the front of the classroom. Movies can play on that. Mm-hmm. So the windows there's like curtains that they can all close, which yeah. I think would be cool. But they'd be they'd be like movies that they watch critically. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to really talk about this movie mm-hmm. as if we were just. As if we were reading this book and then talking about it critically. Mm-hmm. We don't just read the book in class for entertainment. Yeah. It's because it tells us something. Yeah. Too often, I think movies in classrooms are just used as babysitting. The fourth unit I think you would enjoy is called Mime, Mime Plus Music. So this one is about understanding the importance of language through its absence. So we're looking at mimes and also silent films, kind of a slapstick comedy, maybe a little day on that, and just the overwhelming number of words that we encounter our day-to-day lives. I was thinking that in middle school, we once did this assignment in health class, what a weird class that is, where we had to track what we ate for a week, put it into those awful outdated food groups mm-hmm. and see how like healthy we were. Mm-hmm. Do you want to guess which food group I had way more than I was supposed to? Carbs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because one bagel was like six pieces of red. Yeah. And I was a big bagel boy. <laughs> And I was thinking something like that, literally, like it sounds ridiculous, but count how many words you see in a day. Yeah. Obviously, it's a, they would all realize that this is a futile exercise, mm-hmm. but just so that they become aware of that. Yeah, it's a fun. It'd be eye-opening. A fun project. And then the fifth unit is the class play, which the class writes and performs together mm-hmm. for the school. Costumes, props. I think that'd be great. That's wonderful. Yeah, I like that class a lot. Oh, I also forgot to mention like the concrete floor, which forms the stage. Mm -hmm. You can use chalk to map out little sets. That's so fun. And you can also use tables. And I mean, it's, it's kind of DIY. It's not going to be full productions every time, but just some, 
plays don't really need a lot, do they? Yeah. So something like that. Yeah. When I did theater in high school, it was like that. We had the only props we had pretty much were these black cubes that we had mm-hmm. on the stage. So you'd have to build houses out of them, make stairs, do whatever. And it was so fun to use them. As soon as you tape up little things in them to make it look a little more interesting. But Oh, I forgot one other thing, which is at the front of the room also, there's a single bookshelf. And you saw that on the flat wall here. I didn't see that. And it starts out, the year starts with the bookshelf empty. And over the course Whoa. of the class, each book that we read together, or you guys do as a group, or you are reading individually, we're going to find it and put it on the bookshelf. That's really cool. So it's like an evolving uh, canon for the class. Yeah, which I think that's is, fun. It's fun, yeah. I planned to mention from my class and I wanted to have a gallery, which was oh something similar. Oh my, of course Aaron, you did. I can't say anything. <laughs> no, I, I, hey, don't Why do all... I even? Why do I even? It's okay. Yeah. Let's say your class. <laughs> <laughs> so my class, I realized that we renamed it for the zine, but I originally, when I came up with it, called it Creation as like a play on the idea <laughs> of creation, which is like, I know it's a bit... Because dramatic. So, so the school that we were creating for the zine wasn't a Christian private school. But the, it wasn't a Christian course. It okay. was just called Creation because it was a mixture of art and spirituality and culture. But we renamed it Art. How boring. <laughs> so I'm going to call it my Creation course. Because it's the purpose of the course, the objective, was for students to explore a creative outlet of their choosing and a spiritual or cultural practice of their choosing and mix them. Indoctrinating the kids. But they get to choose. They can choose, <laughs> I want to do it about no Scotian culture, about fishing, about climbing trees and hiking and campfires. Like it could be, a, it could just be whatever they want it to be about, but like realizing that these things are significant because when we are in school and they're secular schools, it's almost like those experiences that you kind of can't explain, those like feelings of like being around a campfire, there's no like, opportunity to express them and that's why it's an art course expressing that experience of sitting around a campfire under a full moon in in art so it's also it's also part of why kids grow to resent school because mm-hmm. they associate any kind of feeling essentially mm-hmm. with that's what i have when i'm not in school yeah school is where i go to be numbed yes so this is the touchy-feely art course and so the final project is a project the kids kind of develop throughout the whole year and it's of their choosing of they can be any medium it could be a dance it could be a painting it could be a fiber art and then a practice of their choosing but the course starts out with a bit of art theory taught in a jigsaw manner so you're doing color theory you're doing the renaissance you're doing the history of fabric making then you all put it together and present it to each other and then they also do a bit of a jigsaw of specific artists and specific cultural icons throughout history. So they, it's a bit of like a jigsaw learning of like all the history because they're in eighth grade. So they have an idea about all these things. They have an idea about the world religions and about stuff. But this is really solidifying it. And then they're going to get into starting their projects. So after that foundation was laid. So... They're going to make project proposals for their personal projects. Oh, no. I know. But then the teacher and the faculty is going to match them each with a mentor. Ooh. So, okay, I want to do mine on, I want to make a shirt to describe my experience, my, my love life or something. And then they would either be matched with like a psychologist or with a fiber artist who would be their mentor. And they're also are going to start a group project which is creating a mural in the classroom. So there'd be like a portion of the wall devoted to this. And they're going to just start it and work together on creating a collage of all their different projects. And then the next little bit is going to be working with their mentors and working on their projects in their free time. And then the final presentation of their work. And throughout, there's going to be guest speakers on different topics, workshops on different like types of art and pop quizzes about art they've been consuming as homework. So you come in on Wednesday morning, it's like pop quiz, you have to write or draw something about a movie you've watched this week or a book you've read. So it's like encouraging them to consume art on their own time and rewarding it with grades. How did you feel about pop quizzes? I like almost literally never had them. Oh, we actually did have them. I liked them. Cool. I think they're underused Hmm. because I feel like they test true learning. 
It's true. And it's like a good way to, hey, Vanessa has literally not written anything in her last three pop quizzes. Maybe check in with her, see if she needs some encouragement, see if she needs some suggestions. It's a good way to kind of gauge the students engagement with the course and their engagement just like in their personal life it could be like hey why haven't you been doing this and they're like my mom's been sick and then you can kind of like <laughs> it's like a good opportunity <laughs> such a tone for the heavy but it's a good <laughs> opportunity to like check in with the kids and like a pretty like they'd obviously not they'd be like low stakes it's not going to be yeah. oh you watched the batman i didn't like the batman so you get a zero <laughs> like it's gonna be pretty low stakes but also encouraging them and yeah a lot of the grading would just be on the final project and the group project just effort you don't have to make the best painting in the world, but like, do you like it? Are you happy with it? Did you learn something? Great. Good job. I like the mentorship aspect. It reminds me mildly of The Voice. Yeah. Singing competition TV show. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Exactly like that. And then, yeah, the guest speakers is a key part of it. So it's like a few months up front of just like people, the kids kind of like getting ideas. What do I want to do for my project and then yeah giving them the reins giving them the resources they need to like make that project happen yeah. would you accept this as a final project for me yeah no you wouldn't maybe i would or if i could describe it you'd have to describe it it's like modern art yeah that's all i had for this week we didn't have any questions but i was thinking of one when i was thinking of my course have we done the importance of like spirituality in education or like the holistic aspect of education in the solo scene no but i think you should really try and make a question of it not yeah. just a topic okay how can we teach holistically in the solo scene that's not a very that's so broad how can we create whole humans <laughs> how can we nurture the souls of the students the solo sites the soul souls Ooh. too religious how can we nourish the minds, bodies, and spirits of the <laughs> children? I'm going to go for a question, which is, how can we use music for learning? School of Rock style mm. and jingles. Yeah. But not just in, not just young kids. What music about how for can learning. we learn in the natural world too? Okay. How do we learn from the trees? What do the trees have to teach us? That sounds good. So thank you for listening, everybody, to the seventh Seventh, yeah. Seventh episode of the education series. It's flying by to me. Not really. It seems to be taking quite a while, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm enjoying it every step of the way. And if you want to enjoy it from home without listening, I don't know what I'm trying to say. If you want to buy the zine, you can do so. Through our website. Which is in the description. Thanks for listening. Bye.